We haven't talked about how to choose K. Did you talk about how to choose K? So remember, for each part of the class, there's like one thing that you have to remember. Um, what were they? For logic, it was that implication is not A or B. Um, for uh, for heuristic search, it was uh, F equals G plus H. I feel like there was another one. Um, what would it be for reinforcement learning? I don't know. Bellman's equation? Um, anyway, for this part of the class, uh, if you ever s are stumped on an exam, the secret thing that you write is cross-validation. Because I, first of all, I love cross-validation, so I'm very likely to ask a question about it. And second of all, cross-validation can basically solve any problem. So if, you ever, if I ever ask a question like, how would you do x? And you're like, mm, I don't know. It has something to do with machine learning. The answer must be cross-validation. Um, so how would you choose what k should be? Obviously, cross-validation, but we haven't talked about what that is yet. Uh, how would you choose what, does everyone understand what k does here? k is making the, the classifier more robust to error, but it could also make things wrong. Um, I mean, you're pulling in extra data. What if, if we go back to, the, uh, to over here, I mean, like, what if I have k equal 20? And I'm right here. So like I'm nestled right in some negative examples. And if I were doing one nearest neighbor, I would obviously classify it as negative. But if I do k equals 20 and I pick the 20 nearest points, like they're just more positive points around here. Even though they're not at all near where the sample is, where the, where the new test example is. So if you crank k up too high, you're going to get problems um, on, on looking at new, when you look at new instances. So setting K, it's important. How, do we, how are we going to do it? Do you use the set that you're uh, given to learn with and find whatever K would give you that set? Yeah, kind of. Yeah. So, so, so this is, you're going to learn a lot of machine learning lingo today. It's going to be great. Uh, the point of learning, right, is to generalize well so that when someone gives you new examples, you do well, right? So, so you have this training set that you're training on, um, and you want to score well on the examples that you haven't seen yet. What can you do? Well, let's simulate unseen data. We'll take some of our training data and erase the labels. And we'll learn a classifier using whatever per, using all the different parameter settings. So we'll use a we'll we'll, use, we'll set k equal to one. We'll learn a classifier. We'll set k equal to two. We'll learn a classifier. We'll learn set k equal to three. We'll learn a classifier for all the various values of k that we think we might be interested in. And then we run the classifier on the data whose labels who the the data we had held out from training the held out data, and see how it does. And the performance on the held out data is giving us a glimpse of how this classifier would do on data that it hadn't seen before. And this is especially important for k-nearest neighbor, because k-nearest neighbor memorizes all of its training data. So if we ever test it on anything it's ever been trained on, it's going to get it right, um, very likely. So I suppose definitely with k equals 1. So we, we have to test on data that it wasn't trained on. Um, and then you choose the one that's where it's going to do best. You choose the, the K where the classifier did best on the held out data. So if you have a sparse um, or, or a lot of partitions, this won't work at all. A lot of partitions. Well, who's to say that one chair wasn't noise? I've seen some pretty noisy chairs in my time. I can tell you that. Things I'm like, that's a chair? Give me a freaking break. <laughs> yeah. There's a great book that has pictures of a thousand different chairs. And some of them, it's called, the book's called like A Thousand Chairs or something. It's, uh, you're like, you would not believe the things that, uh, that people 
the people call chairs. So uh, yeah, there we are. Wow, all kinds of stuff. Anyway, don't get me started here. Um, so, ah, uh, there was a wonderfully there was a wonderful acrylic chair that was made out of slabs of clear plastic that were about that thick, and it was a pretty normal chair except it's completely transparent. Um, but suspended in the acrylic are roses. <laughs> So you're, you're sitting on this transparent cloud of roses. It's just amazing. Um, we're getting really off track here. Um, so we were talking about cross-validation, and Frank brought up this point that uh, what if training data is precious to you? Right? What if we only have, you know, what if we had to pay a grad student instead of an undergrad? So it was really expensive. <laughs> so, so, so we have this precious data. We only have like a hundred examples or something, or a thousand chairs or whatever. And someone, so, so taking a whole bunch of training examples, like take a hundred training examples and not using them for training, could really hurt us. What do we do? This is a hard question. I, I, only the people who really. Thoroughly Grok statistics are, are going to th imagine this, uh, the answer to this question. What are we going to do? Wouldn't it be nice if instead of throwing away uh, or holding out a hundred of my tr precious training examples, like they do, the, imagine you're running a chemical plant. There are people who try and make automatic, it's very expensive to employ people to run chemical plants. Um, and so there's a, little, a lot of work on automated. Um, controllers, um, but it's very uh, hard to gather training data because you don't want to run the plant in all kinds of crazy configurations where it might explode and kill people and release toxic sludge and all this stuff. So it's like, you know, cost them all, and they're losing production. Every time they run in a non-optimal setting, they're losing money. So they, you know, if it costs you literally $100,000 to get a training example, you want to minimize the number of training examples you gather. So taking a significant number of them and holding them aside is not palatable to these folks. So what, wouldn't it be nice if we could hold out only a single training example and still have a sense of how the algorithm was, was going to perform on held out data? Wouldn't that be nice? Yes, and it's possible. So what you do, what you do is you hold out a single training example. You learn with k equals whatever. Now you have a classifier, and now you run on that held out example. And you're like, Wheeler, that's nuts. You have the, to, to gauge the accuracy on held out data. I'm testing against one example. Like it's, it's either going to be completely correct or completely wrong. Like, How do I get anything other than 0 or 1 out of this? Fine, do it a 1,000 times. Choose a single random training example to hold out. Train a classifier. Test it on the held out example. You're maximizing your use of your precious training data, and you're getting a, a, a you're, in fact, and you're you're getting a classifier that's very similar to the one that you would use if you had trained on all the data, but yet you're still getting a statistically significant size sample of how it will perform on data that it has never seen. It may sound a little nuts, but it actually works. So that's the beauty of what's called hold one out cross validation. And if you're wondering how to set these pesky parameters in your learner, beautiful idea. Works wonderfully. Now you do have to you have to run your classifier, you know, a hundred times or a thousand times or however much you want. So um, depending on what kind of learner you're doing, that may or may not be easy or difficult. But you learn one day. No. Our training set does not consist of a single example. Our training set consists of all our training data minus one. Okay. And that one we're going to hold out and test on. Because we want to test on some data that we haven't trained on. Okay. We're, we're trying to estimate how well will you do on stuff you have never seen before. So we need something you haven't seen before, so we hold one out. 
And now, if we test on that single example, that's giving us a very noisy estimate of your perform of your generalization performance. So I have to do it a whole bunch of times. Holding out different examples. Yeah. Exactly. So that's cross-validation. Beautiful idea. Oh, I love it. I love, 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 love. Just magic. The beautiful thing is, right, the data is telling you how complex your hypothesis space should be. Like, should I smooth everything over? Have a very high K? Well, if that's the right thing to do, cross-validation will tell you, depending on, on the generalization performance of your classifier. If your data is, is error-free and uh, it's worth having very um, little picky, finicky uh, decision boundaries, the k equals 1, then you'll perform best when k equals 1 on, on this held out data. 